uh, IT sales managers within Ultima Business Solutions. Um, I hope you're all enjoying the beautiful sun this week, um, getting away from the doom and gloom we've all been facing over the last few years. Um, so today, obviously, uh, agenda is to discuss uh, CrowdStrike and Ultima's partnership in stopping breaches with unified endpoint protection delivered from the cloud. Um, yeah, what I'd like to do is obviously just give some context into who Ultima are as a business for any of you that are, are new to us um, or haven't heard of us before. Um, so we are a 30-year-old business uh, with over 450 employees, currently turning over about 140 million. Uh, we're currently uh, procuring IT services from infrastructure managed cloud and security solutions to uh, a circle of, of 2,000 clients across the UK, Europe and the US now at this moment in time. Um, with, with key obviously um, kind of pride in taking businesses on, on a journey with uh, cloud solutions, especially in mind at this moment uh, within Azure and AWS. Um, something we're very proud of is being recognized as a cloud solutions provider at the CRN Awards, which is something we've been recognized as a, a nominee for the last two years. And we're hoping very much that it's going to be third time uh, lucky for us this year. Um, so if I can just uh, kind of go on and, and tell some a kind of story as to why we are or why we have decided over the last 18, to to two, 18 months to two years to partner with CrowdStrike. Um, Ultima very much have been running um, some kind of customer experience surveys within our own client base. And we've found that in particular through running, running our own cloud analyze service, which focuses on three pillars of architecture, cost optimization and security, that a lot of our, our clients and, and vendors alike are also seeing trends that um, people within security are looking to consolidate their agreements. Um, we're seeing more and more now that um, within that, you know, customers are running with three to four different vendors for security solutions. So being able to consolidate that through our partnership uh, with CrowdStrike uh, has really been of something to benefit of us. So through that, we've made the investment uh, as a business to, um, uh, you know, train all of our operational staff and our commercial staff to be able to tell the the CrowdStrike and Ultima um, story, if you like, and, and really recognise the pillars of concern uh, that um, challenges, more importantly, that businesses are finding when they're, you know, looking to migrate into cloud or actually already running services within a cloud environment. And we can do that within Azure and AWS. Um, so, so with that said, um, that, that's kind of all from me, really. Uh, we'd like this session to be as interactive as possible. So please use the chat for any questions that you, you uh, are foreseeing. Um, we hope to answer them for you over this webinar. But if we don't, obviously, our teams will follow up with you individually. Um, so I'd now like to, to hand over to, to James Broad from uh, CrowdStrike. Great stuff, thanks Mark. So hello everyone, um, and to, welcome to today's talk with CrowdStrike. Uh, just a bit of an introduction to myself. My name is James Broad. I'm a senior corporate account executive here at CrowdStrike. I've been with the business now just over four years, and it's been an absolute roller coaster of a ride going from what initially was a leading visionary to now a full-blown market leader in the endpoint protection space. So today, um, I'll be looking to take you through, kind of looking past you know, the media and kind of really what is behind a cyber attack, who, who are these parties and, you know, how do we categorize them and obviously kind of showing you a bit more about how we help organizations to stop the data breach effectively. So firstly, who is CrowdStrike? Uh, CrowdStrike are pioneers of cloud native, cloud delivered cybersecurity solutions. We specialize in addressing the issue of stopping breaches for organizations. So a bit like Mark was saying about pillars, um, we kind of want you to see CrowdStrike as three key pillars. So number one, technology, number two, people, and number three, threat intelligence. Each pillar helps to enhance and self-harmonize each other's offering. For example, through our technology, when we deploy product into customers' environments, we layer in threat intelligence and we have detections and preventions. We're able to correlate that information back to who that attacker is and where else have they been before? We at CrowdStrike say you don't have 
uh, a malware problem, you have a threat adversary problem delivering that malware behind it. Um, our incident responders are going into breached organizations on a daily basis. Um, you know, they're in their hour of need, they've, they've been hacked. Um, we're using product to deploy to get that visibility of what's happening, what context across that environment, and then obviously leveraging threat intelligence to help understand who's behind that attack, what kind of tactics, techniques, and procedures are they using, are there any other backdoors, helping to clean organizations and hand back the environment um, clean and restored in that particular way. So as you can see, um, you know, the people leveraging technology is making their actions quicker, more defined, helping to reduce efficacy, should we say, with threat intelligence. And yeah, each each offering in themselves is almost like a separate department of company, but it's all very nicely integrated together. So what makes CrowdStrike unique is really this, this brain in the cloud we call the threat graph. So effectively, CrowdStrike is 100% cloud business. And uh, we're one of the world's biggest cloud environments, 100%, you know, born for that scale, born for that purpose. And we track on average five trillion events per week. And just to give you some context, when I, as mentioned, first started back at CrowdStrike four years ago, February 2018, uh, the terminology data we're seeing collecting at that point was around 90 billion events a day. So it just goes to show how parabolic the growth of CrowdStrike has been within that time scale. With net new customers, their endpoints, the telemetry data feeding into this threat graph. And we have this sort of community immunity approach of if we see something bad happening on an endpoint somewhere, we're able to share that pretty much instantaneously in near real time to help protect against everyone else. And this kind of uh, this brain, this, this um, data we're seeing, which is over 10 years old now, is correlated from numerous data sources. So, as mentioned, from the real world examples of going into breached infected organizations, delivering that instant response standalone service. You know, we're taking the real world examples back into the systems, but also from other sources like our uh, threat intelligence department tracking over 170 threat adversaries on a global level and taking in their tactics, techniques and procedures, their fingerprints, which make them unique back into the threat graph. Like I say, so we're able to give further context within the, within the platform in the solution. Um, from an architecture perspective, CrowdStrike is extremely simple. Uh, CrowdStrike delivers a single lightweight sensor from a cloud. When we say lightweight, we mean, we mean up to 5% CPU, 10 megabytes of RAM, and around 50 megabytes of disk. And it's the one sensor you'll ever need across all CrowdStrike's Falcon platforms, expanded modules and capabilities. Uh, this is very different to legacy AV solutions. We're not doing scans. We're looking at around 260 processor and CPU events. So it allows us to be very lightweight and um, more kind of focused, should we say, not just on file-based attacks, but fileless and other types of ways to com compromise and exploit a system. So we don't really have those challenges around resource impacts on, on the endpoints, multiple agents, or agent bloats, um, professional services. There's no professional services required to set up tune and configure CrowdStrike to get it to where, where it's advertised to be so. It pretty much deploys immediately immediate prevention, immediate visibility out of the box, which is hugely powerful when it comes to what can I put into my environment today, which will show me everything visibility wise what's happening inside my environment. Could I answer those questions like, is there something that I need to know of and get ahead of? Um, you know, we don't suffer around tuning or, you know, having labs to kind of do, you know, updates and testing before kind of rolling out to production. You know, if there's any disruption and, and interruption to the, the general workforce, this is something we don't really suffer with. And, you know, we have uh, multiple um, uh, sort of like uh, working compatibility with all the individual mainstream operating systems like Windows, Mac and Linux, and of course, cloud as well. So this slide I'm showing you here is a bit of an eye chart. Um, and this is kind of the, the wider capabilities from our Falcon platform. So this is all the individual capabilities we can provide to the single lightweight sensor. So you can start as, as, as minimal as one module, which most people go for Falcon Prevent, or we have certain bundles which kind of bring together certain capabilities. Um, and then from that, you can kind of expand, add additional modules and capabilities. There's no performance impact to that sensor or professional services. So it's very smart in terms of being you know, cloud delivered in that respect. So without kind of going into individual detail, the kind of summary of what we do, I suppose the core aspect of our business really is endpoint protection. 
So it's giving you that prevention, prevention of capability, stopping bad stuff getting in, the visibility of EDR and the context of threat intelligence, and the response functions with you know, Overwatch and our Falcon Complete team deliver remediation uh, pretty much um, immediately for, by real incident responders. Um, so effectively, you know, that prevention detection response, you know, giving you that prevention capability, but also that breach resiliency um, around that also. And then we have that consolidation play of helping to kind of collapse other kind of features of security into the one single sensor journey in that respect. So let's take a step back and focus on the threat adversaries, because this is the reason why you know, people buy security solutions. And let's just quickly take a look at how hackers are portrayed in the media. So if you were to type the word hacker into Google and click search, um, you'll more than likely get a load of kind of search results back and news articles. And they have these kind of various pictures um, depicting you know, kind of skulls and people in hoods and things like that. And you know, we have that kind of conception of you know, what a hacker looks like. It's usually some guy in a dark hood with a hood up, wearing a mask in someone's basement, probably hacking grannies and, and you know, defrauding people and stuff. So we have that kind of um, perception. And obviously, when you get hacked, obviously, you know, this is what happens to your screen. It goes crazy, turns into something like the Matrix. And kind of, you know, there's some sort of visible representation. This is kind of what usually happens in the films and things. And of course, you know, also like in the movies, when the IT team realise they've been hacked, they run some sort of advanced uh, scanning tool and just simply remove all the malware and return back to normal. So the SecOps teams basically give each other high fives all round. Yeah, we've removed the malware, everything's fine, panic averted, and jobs are good. But this is not real life, and that's not exactly what would happen even though you know there may be the perception of what things are to the general public in the real world you know we've seen over the, the past few years numerous examples of stories that show the real real reality of what's happening and, and what hackers can do so if we kind of um skip back to kind of around about this time last year um as you can see here there's a, a picture of a woman what looks to be filling up one jerry can but actually it's really like 10. Um, and this relates back to the colonial pipeline attack last May. And as it turns out, um, the whole attack happened purely because one of the network admins um, used the same uh, credentials for their social media accounts. And um, when their social media account got hacked, um, the hackers put two and two together and basically used their corporate email address with the same uh, password from the hacked email account to basically compromise the colonial pipeline. Um, from that attack, they exfiltrated around 200 gigabytes of data over a two-day period, which no one detected at the time. But the end result was, you know, it's not only that the company that was impacted, you know, they were able to get back up and running after a couple of days and restored full operations. But it was really the, the people on the east coast of America that were the hardest hit. So when the, the pipeline shut down, there was a shortage of all kinds of reserves, or oil, gas, all that kind of stuff. People miss their flights because planes, planes couldn't take off from the airport. Um, and obviously, you know, people like this woman here went out and, and panic brought. So, you know, the, the accumulation of those people, stations ran out of petrol, and obviously this impacted numerous services and deliveries. Believe it or not, there's actually people filling up carry bags with petrol. This is America after all, so the crazy thing is that's what happens. But attacks don't just impact the company, they have a much wider impact zone as you can see with the colonial pipeline uh, proved. So next up we have Dusseldorf, Dusseldorf University Hospital in Germany. Uh, the picture is actually a UK hospital as you can tell. Um, hackers targeted the, hosp uh, to the university, sorry, yet Dusseldorf University Hospital themselves share the same network, they share the same services on the back end. So when um, the university got hacked, Obviously, this filtered over to the hospital. Their systems got locked up, and as a result, they couldn't deliver their services. So they actually had to turn away people and patients, um, you know, for a few days. Um, unfortunately, there was a woman who was turned away, and she was in immediate need of, of, of surgery, and she was directed to a hospital around 20, 30 miles away, but sadly died before she arrived. Unfortunately, you know, she couldn't get that life-saving treatment. I'm not sure if this is the first example of a, a death 
Associate of Bio Cyber Attack. Um, over the last few years, uh, thinking back to 2017 when the WannaCry um, uh, malware first broke on, on the internet, you know, lots of NHS across the UK were locked up. Um, and also kind of back looking back, back last year, um, funny enough around this time as well, uh, Ireland's HSC, so their equivalent of our NHS, had major disruptions um, due to ransomware and similar situation, you know, people were turned away from their appointments, you know, systems are not back up and running. There's a lot of disruption, which obviously has, you know, a wider impact on, on the general population. So we categorize threat actors into three sort of key areas. Number one is nation state, number two is Ukraine, and number three is hacktivism. Oh, excuse me. So as mentioned, we're tracking around 170 threat adversaries on a global level. Each one has their own unique name. Each one has their own unique fingerprint, how they go about, for example, delivering reconnaissance, how they go about weaponizing particular groups of malware or other types of attack techniques, what domains they come from. This kind of gives away who they are behind them. So um, we categorize to, in a quick sense, um, you know, where an attacker group comes from. And so, so for example, bears are from Russia, kittens from Iran, uh, pandas from China, spiders are e-criminal um, organizations. And for those that didn't know, um, a chalima, which is almost like a Pegasus type um, animal, is um, North Korea's kind of uh, mythical, mythical animal, effectively. So that's a chalima. So with a nation state, um, these are effectively groups hired by the government to compromise other organizations or companies or even other governments as well. So we'll give the example of Ocean Buffalo, which is very interesting in terms of um, the COVID pandemic, because when COVID first hit the, the tail end of 2019, Vietnam were one of the first countries to aggressively respond and set up measures and quarantines and things and they locked down their borders very, very early. Um, this is back at a time when, you know, COVID is just something going on in China. And also during this time, uh, the WHO were basically saying there's no confirmed cases of human to human transmission. You know, this is back at the time of, of wet markets, bat soups, and all those kind of things that are kind of going around at the time. So Vietnam were already locking down and preparing their incident response plans to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the reason why they responded as such was because they had their nation state sponsored group, Ocean Buffalo, were in the Chinese government and had you know, exfiltrated some data to say, you know, this is really what's happening inside the country, uh, which is obviously being held from the rest of the world. So because they knew the things were real and were gonna get kind of a lot worse, um, they decided to set up the, the various measures. So until mid-2021, they had one of the best, if not the best, uh, COVID-19 response plans, and obviously stats to associate with that with number of deaths and infections and things. So this is all because they were targeting the Chinese government, taking data and land to understand exactly what's happening. So here we have images of, um, on the right-hand side, the, the famous F-22 Raptor from the US, and on the, the left-hand side, we have the new Chinese stealth fighter, the J-20. As you can probably tell where this is going by looking at both pictures, how similar they are. Um, China basically stole the plans from the US government, the US military. Instead of actually going through the expense of time and cost to, to build and develop and, and create their own. This is similar to the story with um, Turbine Panda, uh, which effectively is a nation state sponsored group which specifically targeted the aerospace industry and exfiltrated numerous data across uh, individual parts of um, the, the construction line. And the end result of this is China manufacturing the C919, which is a direct competitor to the Boeing and their commercial aircraft in this space. And obviously, as you can imagine, it was at a cost far more reduced. So, you know, China kind of taking the lead in terms of stealing intellectual property. You know, companies have spent years and years developing and refining that particular data based on you know them designing and building their systems and China just floating in and taking it to then undercut them from a, from a global level. 
Next up, we have e-crime, e-crime gangs, whom specific, um, who specifically target organizations for financial gain. Money is their sole incentive. Uh, these actors will primarily deploy ransomware as a service and um, are usually kind of behind the latest public ransomware attacks. In particular, Wizard Spider has quickly grown to be one of the more prolific e-criminal actors. Both Wizard Spider and Double Spider recently adopted the Log4j2 exploit and aggressively exploited various organizations for you know, ransom in that particular way. So when we talk about e-criminals, um, we kind of look back over the kind of the criminal ecosystem because um, these guys uh, from a dark web perspective work pretty much like companies. Um, they are, they're running their infrastructure and services um, they have support desks, they have customer feedback ratings, they work together to deliver their attacks. Um, you know, and this is something that, you know, um, has sort of been refined over the years. And that's why hacking groups are becoming increasingly quicker and more refined in, in breaking into uh, organizations. And what's interesting, like, like I said, you know, these guys are actually working together. They're sharing the same data. They're targeting the same organizations, but perhaps coming at a different angle of attack from their end and then what's very interesting about this particular ecosystem you have something called um, access brokers so people supplying sensitive and compromised de uh, credential details to these organizations to uh, effectively make those uh, attacks more successful so just a quick stat of where we are today in terms of um, ransomware payments we're currently tracking around uh, six million dollars on average which is an awful lot of money, especially when you quantify the cost of a secure breach prevention solution like CrowdStrike versus obviously that particular cost. And then obviously not even quantifying the cost that lay outside this, obviously wider negative impacts in terms of brand damage and loss of business. Then finally, we have the hacktivists. Um, the best and most famous example really is the anonymous group um, who are really for the people. And all they do is target companies who they don't agree with their moral standpoints or moral positions. So now talking about how we can directly address the issue from these threat adversary groups. Now really the, the issue is when it comes to defending your organization today, uh, the key metric is speed. So when we look back in time, the threat landscape has evolved drastically over the years. You know, it used to take days or weeks for an attacker to gain a foothold into a customer's environment and then deliver, deliver damage or, or theft of information. Today, that time frame has drastically shrunk to hours and minutes. Uh, threat adversary groups, as mentioned before, are, are kind of leveling out in terms of speed due to them kind of um, creating various services and infrastructure and toolkits and sharing them around. Um, sophisticated attacks obviously are you know, becoming more widespread, um, you know, the information is being shared in that respect. So, you know, they're getting quicker, they're getting more evolved. And obviously that's becoming a bigger challenge to organizations. How can one detect and then rapidly respond before it's too late? So talking about this issue of breakout time, it takes on average two to four hours for an attacker focusing on organization to gain that initial access, uh, go through that particular chain there, and before you kind of go into lateral movement. Um, and, you know, if we're going to try and catch an adversary attacking organization, you know, simply put, there's a race against time between the attacking party and the defending party. And the thing is, you know, if the defending team failed to, to detect and catch the attack in the early stages, then, you know, another stat here is on average, it takes 162 hours to remediate the impact of that, which is almost seven 24 hour days. So CrowdStrike can address this issue by, um, you know, a Falcon complete service and obviously the speed of how we can deliver that service as well. It's no good, no good just having, you know, the technology and a SOC um, capable people behind it, but it has to be done in such a way where, you know, it just completely shuts these attackers out. So we're bringing together people technology process, um, you know, the market leading endpoint technology, along with a highly capable MDR team and its responders as a service. And, you know, we have things set up in a way where remediation is action in minutes. 
So we often talk about, from a CrowdStrike perspective, this ideology to customers of what we call the 1-10-60. One minute to detect, 10 minutes to verify, 60 minutes to respond. And we say to people, you know, can you deliver detection response as quick as this? And typically the answer we hear back is no. Um, as you can see here, you know, what, how we really track internally is more like one minute to detect, six minutes to investigate, and 29 minutes to respond. So when we kind of look back at that two to four hour breakout time, uh, CrowdStrike sits very nicely within that time frame, you know, to, to sort any issues before anything major happens. This service is backed by a breach prevention warranty. So if you get breached whilst being protected with CrowdStrike, you know, we'll put our money where our mouse is and give you the money back. So far to date, there's been zero claims against our breach prevention warranty. In terms of product with the Falcon Complete service, um, you know, we have kind of uh, sort of the more traditional kind of endpoint systems. So the NJV stopping uh, prevention, stopping bad stuff getting into the, the endpoint itself. EDR, giving that visibility, CCTV across all endpoints, may it be physical, virtual cloud, one pane of glass across everything. And then we have uh, Falcon Hygiene Asset uh, Discover, our IT Hygiene Asset Inventory, which effectively is looking at devices connected to your devices, may be supported or unsupported with an endpoint system, like telephones and printers, looking at kind of users, their applications. When was the last time they changed their password? That kind of operational and hygiene piece. So with having all this visibility prevention product in place, we're then able to layer on, you know, our human threat hunting to kind of look at the unknown, the trend change, the, the very kind of suspicious signals that happen inside the environment. Could be false positives, could be something very advanced happening that is designed to build uh, detection and evasion, like low and slow attacks. And then we have our Falcon Complete team that are kind of delivering that 24 by 7 uh, management, but delivering that remediation as a service. And those guys are between seven and 15 years experience just doing instant response. Um, the final piece we've, we've recently added is Falcon Identity, uh, which we'll come on to a bit more detail now because uh, it's a very topical conversation, especially linking back to that Colonial Pipeline example. So going into a bit more about identity attacks, um, and I want to kind of you know show you again this the attacker timeline, the breakout time of you know initial access, persistent discovery, and lateral movement. So from the initial access, um, hackers will look to establish persistence, and then from there, they will go to discover and where they can go to and then move laterally to those endpoints before hitting those endpoints with their tradecraft, maybe ransomware or, or some other type of techniques. Really, the thing here is we're, we're talking about some actions that involve identity and some actions that attackers do on the endpoint. So as I said, the very first step is is for them having very strong credentials. And we don't see that through traditional endpoints. When someone logs in, for example, myself, you know, James Broad logs in uh, in the UK at 8 a.m. and all of a sudden logs in at, from China under the same credentials, um, 10 past eight, a little bit later, you know, the endpoint system wouldn't pick that up uh, because of my valid credentials. So those types of behaviors that we wanna see early on in the attack chain. Also with the uh, you know, uh, fact of identity attacks, uh, we're seeing stats that are saying 80% of all attacks are identity-based or have some sort of form of identity-based element to them. So we see the kind of the two uh, categories here, top to bottom, identity-driven tactics, and then cloud endpoint delivered uh, tactics. So effectively the bottom half of the slide is what we can see, the identity piece is what we can't see without identity there. So, you know, it really does come down to the identity piece, um, you know, to have a bit more about, a bit more understanding what's happening in the earlier stages if we're going to, like, start to mitigate that type of attack. So, we offer that capability, um, and with identity and how we protect the credentials, the Active Directory systems, um, domain controllers and everything like that, it is very much like EDR, but for, for the identity level. So, we're able to use you know, behavioral-based anal analytics to understand the risk and, you know, help create uh, blocking logic. So we can obviously help with, with prevention rules and everything in place. But similar to, you know, the, the thing of blocking is you can't block everything. And if you can't block it, you need to monitor it 
and then create various rules around it and then have people you know keep an eye and manage and and, and kind of do the next step of you know delivering remediation of things so we have the, a highly capable dashboard which kind of takes together all the kind of information and data around you know the context of what's happening from the identity layer create those kind of automated rules and anything that sits outside of that we can keep an eye on and then deliver the response as well and it's very much the same challenge for just endpoint for customers in terms of we can give you a tool which gives you cctv visibility across all your endpoint environment that's great but someone still has to kind of watch and look at alerts and detections and then do the analysis and actions if necessary remediation um, if there is anything concerning so with that kind of visibility and identity we're seeing more and more into that identity layer and that context of what's happening on the endpoint but you know, it still needs to be managed and operationalized to, to make it successful. So now I'm just going to give you an example of, um, you know, what complete looks like with and without identity. So uh, this is uh, your, your typical kind of attack, um, which coming in, say starting from a, a phishing exploit, the attacker gets user credentials. Uh, let's just say like it's late on a Friday afternoon around 4 p.m. Not until they start attempting lateral movement and persistence on the endpoint is when we start to see the attack. And that could be in the middle of the night or on the weekend uh, for convenience in that respect. So that's fine. They've got Falcon Complete in place on the endpoint. We can see that, we can do our thing. We can remove those tactics, techniques and procedures and any sort of trade card that's left in the attacker. And then we can send them an email to say that you know, they, they kind of need to reset their password because we think they've got compromised user credentials. But of course, it's Saturday at 3 a.m. Um, and, you know, they're going to reset their password. Uh, and probably not. So the attacker comes back again on the Monday morning and they're going after other endpoints with those valid credentials they've got. Again, trying that lateral movement persistent stage for the attack to try and get that going. You know, and that's fine. But they have Falcon Complete in place. So Falcon Complete can see the activity going on on an endpoint, we'll contain it, we'll do the remediation piece again. Um, but we haven't still got rid of the attacker. The attacker still has a gateway into the environment. Um, you know, they still have the identity privilege account access. Um, so now they're going after the domain control instead and trying to exfiltrate data from this level. Well, that's fine. You know, they've got Falcon Complete in place. So on the endpoint, we can see that, we can respond to it. The complete team will do their thing again to remediate and, you know, again, recommend the customer reset their password. Then eventually, you know, the customer's going to pick this up and then change the password once we've got um, gone through the cycle enough. So with identity protection in place, let's run through that same example. So on the Friday evening, um, a phishing exploit comes in, they get the credentials and they log in. We've seen them start to do some lateral movement and persistent mechanisms on the endpoint. And then our Falcon Complete team remediates that endpoint. We get rid of the stuff, any artifacts and tradecraft uh, as per the last example. And then we block that user. And that's it. The attacker can no longer do what they're doing. We're just removing another layer of risk. So uh, just to finish up, in terms of CrowdStrike and, and sort of like a, a third party analyst perspective and how we're viewed from a, from a market perspective in terms of our numbers and um, you know reports and everything like that, um, just quickly look at the MDR report, CrowdStrike sit very, very strong now in terms of um, being an MDR provider. So it's not just the product piece, it's delivering that as a service, delivering the outcomes. And you know we have over a thousand customers on Falcon Complete uh, from people such as Mercedes-Benz Petronas, you know, the F1 racing team. And, you know, we say over 60% of sales back in 2021 were Falcon Complete, just because we can give people the power of these products, but some people just don't have 24 by 7 operations, uh, or, or quite frankly, want to go and recruit those people, deliver the outcomes, they just want someone to do it for them. But we do it in such a way where we can um, obviously make it very, very quick, which you know, it is, it's very disruptive against other MDR services, that type of speed. They don't really tend to do that. Uh, but also, um, you know, uh, we offer that breach prevention warranty. So if in a situation CrowdStrike was to fail, then, you know, we'd put our money where our mouth is. 
I just want to spend some time talking about CrowdStrike in the, the latest, from an EPP perspective, so endpoint protection platforms, um, over the past few years, because the CrowdStrike's risen pretty much out of nowhere in a very busy marketplace that has been the usual vendors for the last 15, 20, 25 years, uh, quite a stagnant, stagnant market in some respects, yet obviously hackers are getting in left, right, center, and then along comes something like a CrowdStrike, which effectively has now disrupted the market and become a market leader. So um, this is the 2021 Gartner Magic Quadrant of Forest of Wave. Uh, we're in 2022, so we're looking forward to uh, that report that will come out. Um, as you can see, we're a market leader. Um, Microsoft are actually categorized at the top as well, just because they bundle in all um, Windows Defender ATP of all their operating system cells. So, you know, Microsoft sell a lot of licenses, as you as you imagine, for the backbones of, of most uh, companies, but, you know, they're kind of bundling that in there. So, so if we kind of take a step back to when CrowdStrike first arrived in a, in a, a market analyst report, which is back in 2017, as you can see here um, on the left-hand side of the slide, CrowdStrike was a leading visionary, and then up to 2018, 2019, quickly shifted into the leader's quadrant. The year 2020 was the, the missing year in terms of reports and also the missing year for a lot of people, um, which obviously kind of skipped a beat, but then obviously, oh, sorry, excuse me. Then we can see in the latest 2021 report, CrowdStrike is firmly into the leader's quadrant. And what's really interesting to see, if you kind of look back um, at this trend, is the kind of the mainstream vendors here, you know, and we're not gonna kind of pick on any names in particular, but you know, you can imagine who they are, and in a sense, you know, they've all slid left, they've all slid, slid back. Some of them have now been acquired and sold up to other businesses. And to be frank, you know, we don't see them. Um, and they really needed to do that to re-architect effectively what was signature-based on-premise infrastructure that went cloud-hosted, and then they need to go and build a cloud to stay relevant with today's market. They need to go and build EDR tools. They need to integrate threat hunting and now MDR-type services like CrowdStrike. And then obviously, you know, things like threat intelligence and everything. So um, the business model needed to find more funding. And as a result, they've almost kind of like slid off. And this is really to stay relevant, not just in today's market, but, but for tomorrow's as well. So rest assured, you know, CrowdStrike is a, a very strong player. We only feel like we're just getting going. You know, we're bringing out constant more features and capabilities from the cloud environment. Being cloud allows us to continuously develop, enhance not just our current offerings, but bring out new integrated offerings that make the customer's journey even more worthwhile. So um, just wanted to share that piece with you guys. Um, and sort of finally, just to, just to finish up, um, you know, if you're looking to engage with us, you know, let's have a meeting, let's take you through, you know, CrowdStrike, the modules capabilities, understand yourself in a bit more detail. We can show you a technical demo. Um, no joke, it could take literally four hours to show you everything. We obviously don't want to show you everything, um, but there's a lot of detail and information as I've gone through today uh, about what we do. Um, if you'd like to see us in action as well, there is a live attack and defend uh, demonstration happening next Wednesday, the 30th of March, which is going to show you web show intrusions with our complete team. So uh, feel free to, to come along to that as well. So that said, um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I hope you, you found that session useful and informative, and uh, we look forward to engaging you and talking to you um, in a bit more detail. So thank you very much.